Hey guys, it's Landon Blake from Refined Horizons. It's been a few months that I did, since I did a video on browns, so I feel guilty. It was uh, April, I think, and it's now July. So I'm going to do a short video on browns, chapter three. We're going to have more than one video. Um, I got to keep it short because I'm late getting home for dinner and my wife's going to boil me alive in her giant cooking pot. But I really want I, I wanted to take 10 minutes and get a video out for you guys on Browns Chapter 3. Browns, the Bible, the Bible for Boundary Surveyors in the United States, it's a great book. Um, I, I find as I return to it, however, that um, I'm amazed that I actually learned some things from it as a, as a young surveyor in college. Because a lot of the material is, is pretty technical and complex. I found Chapter 3, like Chapter 1, was not organized in a logical way for me. Um, there's a lot of good information there, but it was hard for me to follow in a logical manner. <clears throat> I didn't have that problem with Chapter 2. So, like Chapter 1, uh, like I did for Chapter 1, in Chapter 3 I kind of I reorganized the, the... It's all material from the chapter, but I reorganized it into some groupings that were a little more logical for me. So, I want to go over two of those groupings with you guys today in this short video. Again, this is on Brown's Boundary Control and Legal Principles, Chapter 3, okay? So we're not going to go over the key concepts. Sorry, we're not going to go over the key terms, the definitions. They're in the study guide, which I will put online and link in the video description. But I do want to talk about some of the key concepts. So I'm going to cover the first two categories in my study notes for Brown's Chapter 3. The first one is the government's role in the U.S. cadastral system. Browns doesn't say a whole lot about that in chapter three, but he mentions a couple things. I'm going to cover briefly uh, my book. The book on land tenure talks a lot more about that, so I encourage you to, to watch the videos on the book on land tenure. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the definition of land title and the different sources of land, land title in the United States, and that's a pretty big section, so we'll cover that. That'll be good for this video. So to get this show moving. So what is the government's role in the U.S. cadastral system? Uh, chapter 3 mentions a couple things. Number one, the, the government has the authority to tax and regulate the use of land. That's part of our cadastral system. Secondly, the courts adjudicate uh, possession and the relationship of possession to title lines. And that gets back to that definition we had about deed lines, uh, excuse me, property lines versus boundary lines. So the boundary line is the deed line. That's where the survey says it is. The property line is where the actual line of ownership is. Property lines take into account certain legal principles like adverse possession and estoppel, boundary line by agreement, those kind of things. So what Browns is saying is the courts, when there's a difference between where the survey says the line should be and where possession says the line should be, the courts adjudicate that in most cases. Okay, that's that's a government role that the courts that's a that the courts play that government function, handle that government function in our property system. That's about how much Browns has to say on the government role in the U.S. cadastral system in Chapter 3, okay? All right, so that brings us to the second kind of main grouping of key concepts, which is the definition of land title and the sources of land title in the United States. So let's zip through these bullet points. So great definition of land title in Browns, Chapter 3. I, I love it. I'm going to use it all the time. Um, I think it's a maybe even better definition than the book on land title, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. So here's the definition. Land title is the means or authority by which a landowner proves legal possession. So that, that tells you there's two kinds of possession, legal and illegal. Okay, Title is how you prove that your possession is legal. It, just because you have title to land, that is, that is not ownership. It's evidence of ownership. Okay, And that why? Why it does not title equal ownership? Well, because we don't have a purely paper title system. We have a hybrid title system that includes unwritten rights through, through possession. Right. So because our legal system supports unwritten rights and because there can be conflicting descriptions uh, descriptions of land that conflict land title is proof of legal possession or proof of ownership it is not it is not conclusive it does just because you have the paper a piece of paper that says you own that land that is not conclusive right because unwritten rights are involved okay so title is the way that you prove that you have legal possession. There are 13 ways to obtain land title in the United States. I'm not going to go over all 13, read the chapter, okay? But I want to talk about the most common means of title transfer, sources of title that land surveyors deal with, okay? That I, that I, in my opinion, they deal with. I'm going to give you six. Title from the, the federal government, that's a patent. You can have title by patent from a state government. So, and usually the way that works is the feds grant it to the states and the states grant it to private parties. That's how swamp and overflow surveys work in California. 
title by deed or private grant, that's the most common situation we deal with as land surveyors, right? It's a deed between private parties. A title by will from a deceased person, so if you die, a judge may distribute your property in accordance with a will or some other legal rules. Title by involuntary transfer, that's if you, if you go bankrupt or foreclose on a piece of property, a judge will take your property and give it to the lender, that's involuntary transfer. Uh, we don't deal with that a lot, but we do occasionally see that as land surveyors. And then the, Browns has what he calls title at law, that just means it's transferred by court decision. Okay, so, and again, that, that touches on, um, you know, if you're in a foreclosure or a bankruptcy or if you don't pay your taxes and there's a tax sale, that's, that's your judge transferring your property. So if I don't pay my taxes on my house and he transfers it to my, there's a tax sale and my buddy Bob buys it, what's the source of Bob's title? Well, it's, it's, the source of his title is a, is a legal decision made by a judge. Okay. Really key principle in Brown's Chapter 3 you can't convey legal title to more land than you own. So if I'm given the west half of section 11 and I sell somebody section 11, the whole thing, uh, they don't get the east half of section 11. They only get what I have legal title to, the west half. Okay? That's a really important concept in boundary surveying. That's where we get into the whole junior senior rights issues. We'll talk about that in another video, but really important principle. You can only sell what you have legal title to. Uh, voluntary transfers of real property need to be in writing. That's the rule that requires that is called the statute of frauds. Most of the states in the United States have made that part of their law. So you can't buy and sell property uh, without a written contract unless a really special exception applies, and there are, there are some. But um, There is a presumption, what under the law we call a presumption or an assumption, that if you transfer title to somebody and you don't say if it's a fee or an easement, the law presumes it's a fee. So that's important. That may change in, by state. I'm not sure, but that's the general principle that Browns outlines. Uh, property transfers in the United States are typically recorded in a public database or public repository. Okay, and uh, we talk a whole bunch about that in the videos on the book on land title, so I'm not going to get into it in detail. Uh, in most of the United States, evidence of ownership titled to land is recorded, not the actual proof of ownership of land. So let me explain that. We talked about Land title is proof that you legally possess, but it's not conclusive, right? It's not the, it's not the be all and, and end all because there could be unwritten rights or other legal principles that, that are in operation. So uh, let me give you an example. I, I sell to Bob that west half of section 11. That go, he goes down and records a deed, okay? Then I sell Jill the same thing, the west half of section 11. She goes down and she records a deed. Now both those deeds got recorded. They're evidence of ownership. Right now, only one's valid, the deed to Bob, because it was first, unless special circumstances are shown, but they can both get recorded. In other words, the recorder's not standing there as a gatekeeper saying, oh, you can't record that because he already gave that to Bob, Jill. You, Jill, you can't record. The recorder doesn't keep track of that. You bring the court recorder a deed, it meets some simple legal criteria, he or she records it. That's it. That's how it works. So, we record evidence of ownership, not conclusive proof. See, Jill and Bob would have to go to court because they both have a valid... They both have what appears to be valid sources of title to that land, so then they'd have to go to court and get that sorted out. Now, it's different in what they call a torn system. I believe there are a couple places in the United States that have a torn system. Chicago might be one. In a torn system, there, you don't allow unwritten rights, and what gets recorded is actual conclusive proof of ownership. It, that's a pure paper title system, okay? but they're not very common. They're pretty rare. Um, a chain of title, he, he, uh, in Chapter 3, Browns explains what that is. It's a record of all transactions related to a parcel back to the time of either the patent from the government or the time of its creation. And so why do you need a chain of title? Well, you might need a chain of title to prove actual ownership, not just evidence of ownership. So in that example I gave where I sold to Bob first, the west half of Section 11, and then later I sold to Jill, both those deeds are recorded. Bob could come up with a chain of title and say, hey, I can prove that Landon owned the west half of section 11 and that he transferred it to me before he transferred to Jill. He can go to a judge with that information. The judge is going to say, Jill, so sad, too bad. Bob's got valid title based on the chain, okay, based on the chain of title. There are judicial alternatives to using a chain of title to prove ownership. So for example, you can quiet title. A lot of times chain of title is expensive. It's not always conclusive. So you can go to a judge and say, hey, 
there's some controversy here. I want you to grant me, through your powers as a judge, clean title to this particular piece of property. In California, we call that a quiet title action. Uh, he points out that surveyors often are interested in researching the chain of title farther back than an attorney or a title company. That's because most attorneys and title companies are only worried about researching back to a statute of limitations. And oftentimes the surveyor is trying to figure out why a change was made in a land description or he's trying to figure out junior senior rights. And so he wants to see all the transactions. It's, it, essentially, at least he wants to research that chain of title back to the deed that created the parcel. So just remember, land surveyors tend to want to go farther back in the chain when they're working on a problem than a title company or an attorney. Brown points that out. I think it's a good, good thing to remember. Uh, land title can be transferred in our system in the United States, our cadastral system, by several le legal doctrines. It's not just voluntary written transfers. So the other things can transfer title, adverse possession, prescriptive easements, boundary line by agreement, estoppel, there's others. So you as a land surveyor need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of those legal doctrines and how they work because that can impact your work. Uh, the evidence that a land surveyor collects in the field during a boundary survey may be used to prove or disprove unwritten rights and land. So you got to be thinking about that when you're doing a boundary survey, land surveyors. you got to be thinking about, is there evidence of unwritten rights? In other words, does possession line up with the, with the boundary line, with the, with the deed lines, with the paper title? Or is there a difference? How big is that difference? Or is there evidence of, of unauthorized use? Could there be a prescriptive right here? Good boundary surveyors think about that stuff. They, they know evidence of those rights. Uh, unwritten rights are created, he, he makes a key point here, they're not created when the judge says, they are created as soon as, at the point in time that the legal criteria are met. So as soon as the legal criteria are met to establish an unwritten right, they're established at that point in time. Now, they're, they may, it may take years, may, years may go by before those unwritten rights are recognized by a judge, but they're not created when the judge recognizes it. They're created as soon as the legal criteria is met, then a judge may later on in time recognize that they exist. Okay, but they, they are created as a function of the law, not based on a ruling on, by a judge. The ruling by the judge just recognizes their existence. I think that's a key point that he makes. Um, a court decree is needed to create marketable title to land or land rights obtained by unwritten means. So you may have a land right or, or adverse possession of a piece of property but you can't sell it probably, and the title insurance company probably isn't going to insure it. If it's acquired by unwritten means, you, you got to go to a judge. You either got to do quiet a title, or there's going to got to go. You got to you got to go see a judge and get him to recognize your unwritten rights. That court ruling will create marketable title that can then be sold and insured in most cases. And then involuntary transfers of real estate are allowed in the United States real property system. Some of those examples of that include foreclosure, tax seizure, and ESHIOP. That's when you die if you don't have an heir, the property, property goes back to the government. So those are all different types of transfers. I gotta go, because I'm in trouble with my wife. But there you go. That covers the first chunk of Chapter 3 of Browns. The next video we do on Chapter 3, we're going to talk about resolution of land ownership conflicts, how that happens. We're going to talk about land descriptions and some of the principles that govern land descriptions, and then we're going to talk a little bit about um, why we have land title abstracting and title insurance. Brown discusses that briefly in Chapter 3. All right, I hope you guys are enjoying the videos. If you're reading Browns as a student, official student or unofficial student, and you have questions, something in the first three chapters that I didn't cover that you want, please send me an email. I will respond to you in person or maybe do a little video reply. Okay, thanks for watching, guys. I appreciate it. I will try and get to chapter second half of chapter three uh, in the next couple of weeks.